let's try computing some entropy changes, and we'll look at two systems we've seen before and a new one as well. So let me start with the ideal gas expanding into a vacuum. That is not a reversible process. But because entropy is a state function, the change in entropy does not depend on the path. And so if we're interested in the entropy change for this irreversible process, we can compute it if we can compute the entropy change for the reversible process. That is, if I look at del Q reversible over T as I integrate from state point one to state point two, that will be the entropy change for the irreversible process as well, because it only depends on the state points, one and, and two. So what is the uh, change in heat, del Q rev? It's equal to du minus the change in work. So that's the first law. Now, this process was isothermal. We had isolated the system from the surroundings when we talk about the irreversible process. It doesn't have to be isothermal in the reversible case. In fact, we'll see it, it can't be, but that's okay. We want to maintain, however, del du is equal to zero. So given that the change in internal energy is equal to zero for isothermal, because an ideal gas's energy only depends on temperature, that means that the reversible heat change must be equal to minus the reversible work. We know for an ideal gas what the reversible work is. It's minus nRT over V dV. And so when I go and I plug all that in, so I want to know the integral from 1 to 2 of del Q rev over T. Well, that's minus the integral from 1 to 2 of del W rev over T. Here's my expression, so the t's drop out. So when I talk about going from one to two, I'm actually talking about the change in volume. That's what's left in this integral, a dv over v. And I get nr log v2 over v1. And so we've actually seen that expression before for the expansion of an ideal gas. And you might think to yourself, well, what, what was the difference between the irreversible process and the reversible process? This is often a point of confusion. And the difference is, what happened to the surroundings? So in the reversible case, in order for the system to be isothermal, heat had to be added to the system. Work is being done during the reversible expansion. The pressure is growing, growing, growing inside that other vessel as I'm allowing myself to expand into it. And so to drive that expansion, if you will, heat must flow into the system. It's done infinitesimally slowly, so you could imagine that piston with sand on it again, for example. Uh, and that's why the external pressure is equal to the ideal gas pressure. But, okay, that's a, an imaginable experiment. And so, if this was the reversible work, it's also the reversible heat, there's a sign change in there. So the gas absorbs heat from the surroundings, and the entropy of the surroundings must decrease as a result, right? Because for the surroundings, there is negative heat. It is giving up heat to the, the system, which is receiving it and receiving it in a positive quantity. So del S surroundings is minus Q reversible over T. This is reversible. Uh, it must be equal and opposite, so I get minus NR log V2 over V1. So the total change in entropy of the system plus the surroundings, zero, which it must be. It was a reversible process, no change in entropy. No change in total entropy, always expected for a reversible process. Focusing now on the irreversible case, when I open that stopcock all at once and it's isothermal, there is no external pressure, so the irreversible work, zero. And the system was isolated, so the irreversible heat flow, zero. Since there's no exchange of heat with the surroundings, there's no change in entropy for the surroundings. The surroundings doesn't even know what happened. It's, that system was isolated from the surroundings. And so the net entropy change, system plus surroundings, well, the system, it was a state function. We already know what happened in the system. 
nr log v2 over v1, but surroundings zero. So for the universe then of system plus surroundings, there has been a net increase in entropy. And that's consistent with our statement of the second law. The reversible process, there was no change. The irreversible process, there was a net increase in universal entropy. So total entropy increases as expected, irreversible process. I will add as a sort of technical note, we used the irreversible heat to compute the change in entropy of the surroundings. I mean, in a sense, it was, it was zero, so maybe that doesn't seem very unnatural, but typically you, you can't do that. We get away with it in this case because there's zero work. And so from a technical standpoint, that made the heat a state function. We didn't have to worry about whether it was reversible, irreversible. Uh, the fact that it was zero is sort of a benefit as well, but that's you know, something that's good to be borne in mind if you're really looking at the nitty gritty of the thermodynamics. Okay, let's take a moment and I will let you uh, answer a question on this front and then we'll move on to consider entropy of mixing. Let's look at the second example we've already considered and that is two vessels with different gases that are then opened one to another. So for each of the two gases, I've, I've only got two in this instance, but if I were to generalize and have I different gases and all allowed to enter one another's volume at a given point, well, we've already worked out again and again what the entropy change is as I expand from a given volume to a different volume. It is, for each individual gas, the number of moles of that gas times R times the log sum over all the volumes that are now accessible, and maybe there's J different flasks that are all interconnected, divided by the original volume. And if I, for purposes that'll become apparent in a moment, if I want to put a minus symbol out front, I can put this sum in the bottom. So all I've done is inverted the argument and hence changed the sign of the logarithm. However, for ideal gases all at the same temperature, the volume is actually proportional to the number of moles. And so I can replace where volume appears with number of moles. So I get the change in entropy for a given gas I is minus the number of moles of I R log number of moles of I divided by the total number of moles in the system. And that's sometimes referred to as the mole fraction. So I'm going to indicate that by yi. yi is number of moles divided by total number of moles, spoken as mole fraction. So this entropy of mixing is minus r n sub i log y sub i. So notice that the mole fraction, as long as there's more than one gas, is always less than one. So the log of a number less than one is always a negative number. I'm preceded by a negative sign. Number of moles is positive, R is positive, and so the entropy of mixing is always positive. Mixing is always spontaneous. Let's do one last example. Here's one we haven't seen before. Imagine that I have two identical pieces of a metal bar, common material. Maybe it's copper, maybe it's manganese, Pick your favorite metal. They're at different temperatures, hot and cold, represented brilliantly here with a red piece and a blue piece. So the red one is hot, it's at TH, and the blue one is cold, it's at TC. And I bring them together. I touch them. So we know that heat will flow between those two systems. It's a bit like our isolated compartments we did previously, but now this is more practical, two metal bars. They're will be almost no change in the volume of these bars as long as I don't have, you know, thousand of degree changes. So the work change is negligible because delta V is negligible. And so the reversible heat change is equal to DU. It's equal to just DQ because given no work, Q becomes a state function. We can talk about reversible or irreversible. It doesn't matter. There's no work, so you don't have to worry about a path for Q anymore. And it's equal to the heat capacity times dt. So if, just to make the math a little bit more convenient here, let's assume that the heat capacity over the temperature range we're interested in is independent of temperature. 
It takes the same amount of heat to go up one degree, the next degree, the next degree after that. It's just a constant heat capacity. So in that case, delta Q, the total heat transfer, is going to be the heat capacity times the initial temperature minus the final temperature, right? whatever temperature I, f I finish up at. Moreover, the heat lost has to be equal to the heat gained. So CV times the hot temperature minus the final temperature must be equal to CV times the cold temperature minus the final temperature. And that means that the final temperature here is not a rocket science equation. It means that uh, it's got to be the average of the original two temperatures. And I suspect there, there might be a sign error here. I probably want to switch this around uh, and make this negative. One is heat in, one is heat out. But I, I think the final conclusion that the average heat is the final temperature, the, the average temperature is the final temperature is a conclusion that seems obvious. So then, what is the change in entropy? Well, it is for each of these bars, the integral from the initial temperature to the final temperature, irrespective of whether that initial temperature is the hot or the cold, dq over t. I don't have to write reversible here because heat is a state function in this case. There's no work. So I now replace dq with cv dt, and I end up with the integral from initial to final temperature of dt over t. So that's cv log final temperature over initial temperature. OK, so let's keep working with that. And think about it now rod by rod. So what is the, this integral in the case of the cold rod? Well, the final temperature is Tc plus Th over 2. The initial temperature is the cold temperature, Tc. And so delta S is Cv times log of this quantity. Now let's do the hot rod. Well, in the hot rod case, we don't mean a very fast car in this instance, by the way, old use of hot rod. Uh, it's Tc plus Th over 2 is the final temperature. The original temperature is Th. So these two look the same, except one has a C in the bottom and one has an H in the bottom. And so the total entropy is the sum of the two of these. A sum of logarithms is like a log of a product. And so if I take the product of the numerators, I get a Tc plus Th quantity squared. If I take the product of the denominators, I get 4 Tc Th. And I can ask now, will this be spontaneous? It'll be spontaneous if delta S is greater than 0. Well, how can I establish that? Here's a little proof that this is greater than 1. Right? And in order to prove that, I need the numerator to be greater than the denominator. If that's always true, then I have log of a number greater than 1. Delta S will be greater than 0. The heat flow will be spontaneous. So how can I prove that? Well, here's a quick little proof. Consider Tc minus Th squared. Well, since that's a number squared, it's greater than 0, unless they start at the same temperature, but then I don't worry about heat flow. Uh, I expand this squared quantity, Tc squared minus twice the cross term plus Th squared is greater than 0. Add to both sides 4 Tc Th. So that means minus 2 goes to plus 2, and this side ends up with 4 Tc Th. Ah, but what is this side now? Oh, look, it's Tc plus Th all squared. So I have just proven that the numerator, Tc plus Th squared, is greater than the denominator, 4 Tc Th. So indeed, as we would expect based on our life experience, yes indeed, those two rods come to an equilibrium temperature that's halfway in between their original temperatures. Great. Well, that has been three different systems where we've seen how we can use reversible processes to learn about the entropy change, even associated with an irreversible process, knowing that there will be a difference in total entropy of the universe, but we know how to work with reversible changes, and that allows us to accomplish things and actually do practical computations. Uh, we're going to go on and next consider the relationship of entropy to the partition function. Now, before we actually get to that, though, I think it is time to do another demonstration, and a particularly interesting one that seems to violate briefly the entropy of mixing. I'll call this demo the anti-entropy of mixing. 
I hope you enjoy it. In this demonstration, we'll see that sometimes we can fight thermodynamics almost to a draw, even if we can never prevail against one of the three laws. On the bench here, I have a cylindrical flask inside of which is another cylinder of only slightly smaller diameter. In between the two is a fluid that is clear and colorless. At one position along the cylinder, a line of dye has been added to the fluid. Do you see? What will happen if I turn the inner cylinder? Certainly we know that the entropy of mixing will favor distribution of the dye uniformly throughout the available volume. So let's see what happens. Sure enough, as I turn the cylinder, the dye distributes. And by the time I've done about two revolutions, the color seems to be widely distributed throughout, even if not yet completely uniform, about as one might expect. Now, what will happen if I reverse my turning of the inner cylinder? We know that mixed substances cannot spontaneously separate unless there is some kind of phase change. So the normal expectation would be for nothing obvious to happen. But let's try. Wow! All the dye has returned almost perfectly to its original position. What's happened? Have we beaten entropy? The answer is no, although your eyes have been tricked into thinking it true. The trick that is involved is that the very thin layer of fluid between the two cylinders causes the flow in the liquid to be extremely uniform with little exchange between adjacent small volume elements. The apparent homogeneous mixture that was created by our initial rotation of the inner cylinder was not actually homogeneous, but simply uniformly distributed the dye around the circumference with the possibility of bringing it back through reversal of the motion. If we were to measure carefully, we would see that there has been some broadening of the dye line, driven by entropy, and if we were to repeatedly cycle back and forth, with each step, the mixing would become more complete until indeed we did end up with a homogeneous mixture of the dye and the fluid. So remember, the second law does allow for reversible processes having zero entropy change. While they are often hard to engineer in practice, they are not impossible. And this device is one example that illustrates a process that is very nearly reversible.